Malaysian University English Test, Session 3, 2021. Listening. There are five parts to the test. You will listen to each part twice. As you listen, indicate your answers on the multiple choice answer sheet. Please ask any questions now because you must not speak during the test. Now open your question paper and look at part one. Part 1. Listen to a conversation between Joanne and her friend Raza. As you listen, choose the correct answer for questions 1 to 7. You now have 30 seconds to look at the questions. Now listen carefully and indicate your answers on the multiple choice answer sheet. Hi Joanne, I heard you bought a new house near your office. Huh? I've just started working. I have no money to buy a house. Actually, my aunt moved to Australia to live with her daughter. So she asked me to move to her flat and take care of it. My parents were okay with the idea. It's a new experience living alone. How did you move your things there? I remember you had more things than us when we finished college. We had to help you carry the boxes. Oh my, you still remember that. I feel so embarrassed. And your parents had to drive six hours to come and pick up your things back then. <laughs> yes, that's true. It's easy for me this time. I had to drive only 20 minutes from my parents' house to the flat. I have my own small car, remember? So I moved my things little by little over three weekends. It took me about 15 trips. 15 trips? You should have asked friends to help. Did you move everything from your room to the new flat? No, the flat has everything. I didn't have to bring any pots and pans. I brought all my clothes and magazines, though. They follow me everywhere I go. I left behind my soft toys. Um, I may bring my sewing machine later. Why did you have to make 15 trips for just those things? I had to do four trips just for my potted plants. They didn't look a lot when they were at my parents' house. I had to put layers of newspapers on my car seat. I did not want the soil to dirty my car. I did not put them in the boot of the car because some of them are tall. Where do you put the plants now? At the balcony. The balcony is huge. The plants add color to my flat. I'm thinking of putting a small table out there. Then I can sit outside and have a drink at night. I think this is the best part of the flat. How many rooms are there? There are only two bedrooms, a huge master bedroom and a really small room. How about the kitchen? Oh, it is small. As soon as you enter the flat, you will see the kitchen on your left. My dining table is there too. I miss the huge kitchen in my parents' house. At my parents' place, there are rows of shelves lined up all the way to the ceiling. They also have an exhaust fan to clear the smoke when we cook. When I cook in the flat, the smell goes everywhere. I guess I have to use the oven to cook. And what about your bedroom? My bedroom is huge. As you enter, you will see a study table in front of you. Next to the table is a panel of windows. I can see the park from my windows. From the door, you will see a cupboard on your left. I have placed my bed next to the cupboard. I really love my bed. It's big and comfortable. Next to my bed, I have placed a lamp. You know how much I love reading. Now I can read before I go to bed. Why do you have a table in your room? Oh, that's where I put my laptop and some documents for work. I sometimes have to finish office work at home. The laptop is not for playing games. Must be nice to have your own place. When can I come and visit? 
Soon. I will inform you through our group chat. Don't forget to prepare some delicious food for us. Now you will listen to the recording again. Hi, Joanne. I heard you bought a new house near your office. Huh? I've just started working. I have no money to buy a house. Actually, my aunt moved to Australia to live with her daughter. So she asked me to move to her flat and take care of it. My parents were okay with the idea. It's a new experience, living alone. How did you move your things there? I remember you had more things than us when we finished college. We had to help you carry the boxes. Oh my, you still remember that. I feel so embarrassed. And your parents had to drive six hours to come and pick up your things back then. <laughs> yes, that's true. It's easy for me this time. I had to drive only 20 minutes from my parents' house to the flat. I have my own small car, remember? So I moved my things little by little over three weekends. It took me about 15 trips. 15 trips? You should have asked friends to help. Did you move everything from your room to the new flat? No, the flat has everything. I didn't have to bring any pots and pans. I brought all my clothes and magazines, though. They follow me everywhere I go. I left behind my soft toys. Um, I may bring my sewing machine later. Why did you have to make 15 trips for just those things? I had to do four trips just for my potted plants. They didn't look a lot when they were at my parents' house. I had to put layers of newspapers on my car seat. I did not want the soil to dirty my car. I did not put them in the boot of the car because some of them are tall. Where do you put the plants now? At the balcony. The balcony is huge. The plants add color to my flat. I'm thinking of putting a small table out there. Then I can sit outside and have a drink at night. I think this is the best part of the flat. How many rooms are there? There are only two bedrooms, a huge master bedroom and a really small room. How about the kitchen? Oh, it is small. As soon as you enter the flat, you will see the kitchen on your left. My dining table is there too. I miss the huge kitchen in my parents' house. At my parents' place, there are rows of shelves lined up all the way to the ceiling. They also have an exhaust fan to clear the smoke when we cook. When I cook in the flat, the smell goes everywhere. I guess I have to use the oven to cook. And what about your bedroom? My bedroom is huge. As you enter, you will see a study table in front of you. Next to the table is a panel of windows. I can see the park from my windows. From the door, you will see a cupboard on your left. I have placed my bed next to the cupboard. I really love my bed. It's big and comfortable. Next to my bed, I have placed a lamp. You know how much I love reading. Now I can read before I go to bed. Why do you have a table in your room? Oh, that's where I put my laptop and some documents for work. I sometimes have to finish office work at home. The laptop is not for playing games. Must be nice to have your own place. When can I come and visit? Soon. I will inform you through our group chat. Don't forget to prepare some delicious food for us. That is the end of part one. Now turn to part two. Part two. Listen to a talk by Eileen, an animal lover and volunteer, talking to a group of students during an animal awareness campaign in their school. As you listen, choose the correct answer for questions 8 to 14. You now have 30 seconds to look at the questions.
Now listen carefully and indicate your answers on the multiple choice answer sheet. I am delighted to be here because I love cats and dogs and I strongly believe that they should be treated with love and respect. Unfortunately, there are many stray animals around us, mostly abandoned by their owners. I've adopted more than 30 cats. As I live alone in a double-story house, I let them have the ground floor while I live upstairs. People think I'm mad. One day, a friend told me there's a dog in the big drain. I quickly drove there to see if I could help, but I couldn't because the drain was wide and deep. The poor animal was neck deep in smelly drain water and caught in some rope. We had to call the fire and rescue department and the firefighters managed to rescue the black dog. It couldn't stand up and we realized both its hind legs were actually broken. I took it home, washed it and gave it some food, but it refused to eat. Maybe it was traumatized by the experience or was abused before. It's eating now and I have been nursing it for three weeks, but it is still weak. Later, when it is better, I will send it to our dog shelter, the one that my friends and I set up in 2018. You see, there are people in my town who do not like stray dogs, so they will complain to the town council. Council workers have no choice but to catch the dogs and send them to a dump site outside the town. My friend Mamie and I rescued many from there and took them back to our homes. But soon, there were too many. So we decided to set up a shelter, but it was not an easy thing to do. Finally, we found a kind man who let us use a small part of the land behind his factory to set up our dog shelter. It's been two years now. We have rescued more than 80 dogs, mostly puppies and their mothers. We used our own money to buy food and medicine for the animals at first. But later on, we started receiving donations from other animal lovers when we posted our activities and photos on our social media. They donated rice, dog food, blankets and medicine. Some pet shops also gave us special discounts. Even vets of private animal clinics have donated some vaccines and medication. It's really amazing how kind some people are and we're really grateful. Since we set up the shelter, volunteers take turns to feed the animals and clean the shelter. Mamie and I volunteer every Friday where the dogs are treated to special meals. I'll cook 10 kilograms of rice and 5 kilograms of chicken to feed the 32 dogs and puppies we have in the shelter now. The puppies don't need to be fed milk. They have their mothers. On other days, the dogs are fed with dog biscuits. It's a lot of work for the few volunteers that we have. There are days when there are no volunteers at all. So we hope they are more joining us soon. The dogs sometimes fight and get injured. So we learn to be vets and nurses too. Oh yes, I forgot to mention that we have to clean up the poo as well. That is why very few people are willing to be volunteers. If they can spend their free time traveling or shopping, why not care for abandoned or stray animals too? I believe that taking care of helpless animals is rewarding. We do things out of love and with friends, we feel very happy although we are tired. When we see the animals jumping and wagging their tails happily during feeding time, we know they are saying, thank you, we love you. Now you will listen to the recording again. I am delighted to be here because I love cats and dogs, and I strongly believe that they should be treated with love and respect. Unfortunately, there are many stray animals around us, mostly abandoned by their owners. I've adopted more than 30 cats. As I live alone in a double-story house, I let them have the ground floor while I live upstairs. People think I'm mad. One day, a friend told me there's a dog in the big drain. I quickly drove there to see if I could help, but I couldn't because the drain was wide and deep. The poor animal was neck deep in smelly drain water and caught in some rope. We had to call the fire and rescue department and the firefighters managed to rescue the black dog. 
it couldn't stand up and we realized both its hind legs were actually broken. I took it home, washed it and gave it some food, but it refused to eat. Maybe it was traumatized by the experience or was abused before. It's eating now and I have been nursing it for three weeks, but it is still weak. Later, when it is better, I will send it to our dog shelter, the one that my friends and I set up in 2018. You see, there are people in my town who do not like stray dogs, so they will complain to the town council. Council workers have no choice but to catch the dogs and send them to a dump site outside the town. My friend Mamie and I rescued many from there and took them back to our homes. But soon, there were too many, so we decided to set up a shelter, but it was not an easy thing to do. Finally, we found a kind man who let us use a small part of the land behind his factory to set up our dog shelter. It's been two years now. We have rescued more than 80 dogs, mostly puppies and their mothers. We used our own money to buy food and medicine for the animals at first, but later on, we started receiving donations from other animal lovers when we posted our activities and photos on our social media. They donated rice, dog food, blankets, and medicine. Some pet shops also gave us special discounts. Even vets of private animal clinics have donated some vaccines and medication. It's really amazing how kind some people are and we're really grateful. Since we set up the shelter, volunteers take turns to feed the animals and clean the shelter. Mamie and I volunteer every Friday where the dogs are treated to special meals. I'll cook 10 kilograms of rice and 5 kilograms of chicken to feed the 32 dogs and puppies we have in the shelter now. The puppies don't need to be fed milk, they have their mothers. On other days, the dogs are fed with dog biscuits. It's a lot of work for the few volunteers that we have. There are days when there are no volunteers at all. So we hope they are more joining us soon. The dogs sometimes fight and get injured. So we learn to be vets and nurses too. Oh yes, I forgot to mention that we have to clean up the poo as well. That is why very few people are willing to be volunteers. If they can spend their free time traveling or shopping, why not care for abandoned or stray animals too? I believe that taking care of helpless animals is rewarding. We do things out of love and with friends, we feel very happy although we are tired. When we see the animals jumping and wagging their tails happily during feeding time, we know they are saying thank you, we love you. That is the end of part two. Now turn to part three. Part 3. Listen to three students, Rizal, Anna and John, talking about the effects of online communication. For questions 15 to 17, choose from the list A to E, the main effect of online communication according to each speaker. Use the letters only once. There are two extra options which you do not need to use. You now have 15 seconds to look at the questions. Now listen carefully and indicate your answers on the multiple choice answer sheet. Speaker 1. Rizal Handphones and tablets have been widely used for communication only since about 10 years ago. No one would have imagined how these devices have changed our behaviour. I find it difficult to live without my handphone. I got into the habit of constantly looking at my phone to see if I have any new messages or updates. I also check my apps to see what's new. I don't post my life online, not like some people who cannot live without updating their status on their social media. But I sometimes like to keep up with what people are up to. You know, old school friends, family, and people I know but I have not seen them for years. I like to check out photos of what they look like now. Speaker 2, Anna. 
It's funny how we are always worried about teenagers being obsessed with online communication. I think we need to worry just as much about adults. At my office, everyone is too busy checking their social media and sending messages. Such a sorry state of affair to say the least. They have no time to talk to one another. If they do have to talk, it will be very brief and awkward. They spend their lunch breaks staring at their screens, barely talking to one another. Even during meetings, they cannot resist checking their phones. What really makes me angry is when I'm speaking to someone, he is more interested in looking at his phone than listening to what I'm saying. Speaker 3, John My generation is so different from my parents' generation. They are always telling me that they grew up in a world without smartphones and social media, and they managed fine. I can't imagine how they arranged to meet their friends without a phone. I had so many arguments with them when I was growing up. I wanted a smartphone so that I can download apps. They refused to give me one. Even after they bought me my first smartphone, the arguments did not stop. They didn't let me have Facebook or Instagram. That's bad. They didn't understand that people of my age communicate and share moments with each other through social media. Nobody actually talks on the phone anymore. My parents have no idea how much I missed out at school because I was the only one not sharing live stories with friends. Now you will listen to the recording again. Speaker 1. Rizal Handphones and tablets have been widely used for communication only since about 10 years ago. No one would have imagined how these devices have changed our behaviour. I find it difficult to live without my handphone. I got into the habit of constantly looking at my phone to see if I have any new messages or updates. I also check my apps to see what's new. I don't post my life online, not like some people who cannot live without updating their status on their social media. But I sometimes like to keep up with what people are up to. You know, old school friends, family, and people I know but I have not seen them for years. I like to check out photos of what they look like now. Speaker 2, Anna It's funny how we are always worried about teenagers being obsessed with online communication. I think we need to worry just as much about adults. At my office, everyone is too busy checking their social media and sending messages. Such a sorry state of affair to say the least. They have no time to talk to one another. If they do have to talk, it will be very brief and awkward. They spend their lunch breaks staring at their screens, barely talking to one another. Even during meetings, They cannot resist checking their phones. What really makes me angry is when I'm speaking to someone, he is more interested in looking at his phone than listening to what I'm saying. Speaker 3, John My generation is so different from my parents' generation. They are always telling me that they grew up in a world without smartphones and social media, and they managed fine. I can't imagine how they arranged to meet their friends without a phone. I had so many arguments with them when I was growing up. I wanted a smartphone so that I can download apps. They refused to give me one. Even after they bought me my first smartphone, the arguments did not stop. They didn't let me have Facebook or Instagram. That's bad. They didn't understand that people of my age communicate and share moments with each other through social media. Nobody actually talks on the phone anymore. My parents have no idea how much I missed out at school because I was the only one not sharing live stories with friends. That is the end of part 3. Now turn to part 4. Part 4 Listen to a conversation between Salman, a student, and Lillian, a line dance instructor. As you listen, choose the correct answer for questions 18 to 24. You now have 30 seconds to look at the questions.
Now listen carefully and indicate your answers on the multiple choice answer sheet. Hi Lillian. Oh hi Salman. Sorry to keep you waiting. My class ended 10 minutes later than usual today. It's alright. I was admiring the photographs of your dance performances and the many certificates hanging on your wall. They are really impressive. Thanks. Well, they are pictures of different groups of dancers I've taught and some of them have retired and stopped dancing. It's been years since I started teaching line dancing. Those are certificates of appreciation we received for performing during charity events. We never competed in contests. We just danced for fun and friendship. I love dancing. K-pop is my favourite, but for my assignment, I'm doing research on the benefits of line dancing. I hope you can offer me some information. I know it's mainly for old people, but I think if it's good for them, it should be good for me or anyone my age. No problem. Ask me anything about line dance. I'll be very glad to tell you everything there's to know. Well, I'm really hoping more old people will join my classes so I can collect more fees. <laughs> you know, it's a joke. Of course, it's never about money. <laughs> I know. Okay, how popular is line dancing today compared to a decade ago? Well, in terms of popularity, of course, there's no research. But I dare say it's more popular today. Here in Tawau, there are at least three dance studios offering line dancing classes. In other parts of Malaysia, the number of dance studios is increasing. But not every studio offers line dancing lessons. And we have more line dancing instructors now. Even in my instructor WhatsApp group, there are at least 50 of us. Oh, I see. Why do people line dance and who are the dancers? Line dancing is a unique form of exercise because it's good for the heart, like aerobics. At the same time, it allows dancers, mostly elderly men and women, to socialise and build friendships. You see the group of dancers in the pictures? They're like a large family. They may have stopped dancing, but they do organise reunion dinners every year to keep in touch with one another. You said line dancing is good for the heart. Are there any studies to prove this? Oh yes, the new Journal of Medicine. Experts have studied elderly participants who were 75 and above for more than 20 years. They found that dancing can reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease and dementia. Those who dance for more than 10 days a month had a 63% lower risk of suffering from these illnesses. Can line dancing beat other physical activities like playing tennis, swimming, cycling or walking? Oh, they are definitely good for the heart. But none of these activities offer any protection against dementia like line dancing does. Really? Why is that so? Line dancing requires mental effort. Dancers have to remember the steps and follow the rhythm of the music. In fact, their body becomes very flexible. You'll be surprised how they can bend, twist, turn and balance their body like young people. Oh wow, I would love to see that. Any other advantages? Plenty. Coordination is another advantage. Line dancing is about moving perfectly with the beat of the music. This can be challenging but rewarding once you can do it. Dancers become confident. My dance studio is also a perfect place for the elderly to make friends and this can prevent loneliness. It can be a major issue for elderly people because it can lead to depression. So, joining a local dance club can be a perfect solution to add a little happiness into their life. It's been such a pleasure talking to you, Lillian. I've gathered so much information. I hope you let me stay on to watch you guys dance. Oh, sure! I have another lesson in an hour's time and you're welcome to watch or even join in the dance. Now you will listen to the recording again. Hi Lillian. Oh hi Salman. Sorry to keep you waiting. My class ended 10 minutes later than usual today. It's alright. I was admiring the photographs of your dance performances and the many certificates hanging on your wall. They are really impressive. 
Thanks. Well, there are pictures of different groups of dancers I've taught and some of them have retired and stopped dancing. It's been years since I started teaching line dancing. Those are certificates of appreciation we received for performing during charity events. We never competed in contests. We just danced for fun and friendship. I love dancing. K-pop is my favourite, but for my assignment, I'm doing a research on the benefits of line dancing. I hope you can offer me some information. I know it's mainly for old people, but I think if it's good for them, it should be good for me or anyone my age. No problem. Ask me anything about line dance. I'll be very glad to tell you everything there's to know. Well, I'm really hoping more old people will join my classes so I can collect more fees. <laughs> you know, it's a joke. Of course, it's never about money. <laughs> I know. Okay. How popular is line dancing today compared to a decade ago? Well, in terms of popularity, of course there's no research, but I dare say it's more popular today. Here in Tawau, there are at least three dance studios offering line dancing classes. In other parts of Malaysia, the number of dance studios is increasing. But not every studio offers line dancing lessons. And we have more line dancing instructors now. Even in my instructor WhatsApp group, there are at least 50 of us. Oh, I see. Why do people line dance and who are the dancers? Line dancing is a unique form of exercise because it's good for the heart, like aerobics. At the same time, it allows dancers, mostly elderly men and women, to socialise and build friendships. You see the group of dancers in the pictures? They're like a large family. They may have stopped dancing, but they do organise reunion dinners every year to keep in touch with one another. You said line dancing is good for the heart. Are there any studies to prove this? Oh yes, the new Journal of Medicine. Experts have studied elderly participants who were 75 and above for more than 20 years. They found that dancing can reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease and dementia. Those who danced for more than 10 days a month had a 63% lower risk of suffering from these illnesses. Can line dancing beat other physical activities like playing tennis, swimming, cycling or walking? Oh, they are definitely good for the heart. But none of these activities offer any protection against dementia like line dancing does. Really? Why is that so? Line dancing requires mental effort. Dancers have to remember the steps and follow the rhythm of the music. In fact, their body becomes very flexible. You'll be surprised how they can bend, twist, turn and balance their body, like young people. Oh wow, I would love to see that. Any other advantages? Plenty. Coordination is another advantage. Line dancing is about moving perfectly with the beat of the music. This can be challenging, but rewarding once you can do it. Dancers become confident. My dance studio is also a perfect place for the elderly to make friends and this can prevent loneliness. It can be a major issue for elderly people because it can lead to depression. So, Joining a local dance club can be a perfect solution to add a little happiness into their life. It's been such a pleasure talking to you, Lillian. I've gathered so much information. I hope you let me stay on to watch you guys dance. Oh, sure. I have another lesson in an hour's time and you're welcome to watch or even join in the dance. That is the end of part four. Now turn to part five. Part 5. Dialogue 1. Listen to a conversation between two friends, Sofian and Haslina, talking about buying a used car. As you listen, choose the correct answer for questions 25 and 26. You now have 15 seconds to look at the questions.
Now listen carefully and indicate your answers on the multiple choice answer sheet. Hi, Haslina. I bought a car. It's a 2015 Hyundai Elantra. Why didn't you buy a new car? It's way beyond my budget. I've heard of people having unpleasant experiences when they purchase used cars. How was yours? I had no issue. How did you go about buying yours? First, I decided on which make I want, like Proton, Toyota or Nissan. I was looking for a foreign-made car. The newer the model, the better, with as few kilometres on it as possible. My budget was approximately 40,000 ringgit. And? You can check some used car websites, then select the criteria of the car you're looking for, like the make, the model and the price range. You'll get a list of cars on sale that match your criteria. It took me about a fortnight to narrow down my choices to a few. I test drove a few of the cars I've shortlisted and took note of the issues each car had. After all that, how did you finally decide on the Elantra? I made the final decision after I inspected both the internal and external parts of the car. The internal includes the seats, carpets, lights, and most importantly, the engine. For the external, I checked on the tyres, paint and body of the car. Overall, almost everything is in good condition. The seats have some coffee stains, but I'm not bothered. All my car needs is just a fresh coat of paint. Did you bargain on the final price? Of course I did. The dealer asked for 42,000 ringgit, but after some negotiation and bargaining, we still a deal at 40,000 ringgit. Not bad, eh? Good for you. Let's go for a drive. Now you will listen to the recording again. Hi, Haslina. I bought a car. It's a 2015 Hyundai Elantra. Why didn't you buy a new car? It's way beyond my budget. I've heard of people having unpleasant experiences when they purchase used cars. How was yours? I had no issue. How did you go about buying yours? First, I decided on which make I want, like Proton, Toyota or Nissan. I was looking for a foreign-made car. The newer the model, the better, with as few kilometres on it as possible. My budget was approximately 40,000 ringgit. And? You can check some used car websites, then select the criteria of the car you're looking for, like the make, the model and the price range. You'll get a list of cars on sale that match your criteria. It took me about a fortnight to narrow down my choices to a few. I test drove a few of the cars I've shortlisted and took note of the issues each car had. After all that, how did you finally decide on the Elantra? I made the final decision after I inspected both the internal and external parts of the car. The internal includes the seats, carpets, lights, and most importantly, the engine. For the external, I checked on the tyres, paint and body of the car. Overall, almost everything is in good condition. The seats have some coffee stains, but I'm not bothered. All my car needs is just a fresh coat of paint. Did you bargain on the final price? Of course I did. The dealer asked for 42,000 ringgit, but after some negotiation and bargaining, we sealed a deal at 40,000 ringgit. Not bad, eh? Good for you. Let's go for a drive. That is the end of Dialogue 1. Now look at Dialogue 2. Dialogue 2. Listen to a conversation between Andrea and Ashok, a nutritionist, talking about intermittent fasting. As you listen, choose the correct answer for questions 27 and 28. You now have 15 seconds to look at the questions. Now listen carefully and indicate your answers on the multiple choice answer sheet. Hi, Andrea. Long time no see. Hi, Ashok. I need your expert advice. You know, I've struggled to keep down my weight since our undergraduate years. I've tried the Atkins diet, liquid diet, raw food diet, but none worked. It's incredibly frustrating. Any recommendations, uh, perhaps a tailor-made dieting program? 
exercising regularly won't fit in your hectic lifestyle. I bet you often have irregular meals. It's not surprising when you eat, you'll have a huge portion and start binging. So this popular dieting plan I'm recommending may work well for you. It's called intermittent fasting. Sounds foreign to me. It's an eating pattern between periods of fasting and eating. You're strictly forbidden from eating for a long stretch of time, and when you're allowed to, you can do it only for a short period. One plan for beginners is the 168 method. 168? Tell me more. You must fast for 16 hours continuously and only eat for the next 8 hours. If your last meal is at 8 p.m., it's only at midday you can eat your lunch followed by tea and dinner, all done before 8 p.m. After that, you start fasting again and follow the same cycle. While fasting, you can drink beverages but without sugar and milk. The best is just to drink water. That's marvellous. I don't have to force myself to eat only one meal. Next question. Can I eat anything I want? Oh no, your meals should consist of more fruits, vegetables and proteins, but less carbohydrates. Follow this regime strictly. Intermittent fasting has been proven to reduce up to 8% of your body weight in 3 months. Studies have also shown that it improves blood sugar levels, decreases cholesterol and boosts longevity. Okay, thanks for the info, Ashok. Now you will listen to the recording again. Hi, Andrea. Long time no see. Hi, Ashok. I need your expert advice. You know, I've struggled to keep down my weight since our undergraduate years. I've tried the Atkins diet, liquid diet, raw food diet, but none worked. It's incredibly frustrating. Any recommendations of perhaps a tailor-made dieting program? Exercising regularly won't fit in your hectic lifestyle. I bet you often have irregular meals. It's not surprising when you eat, you'll have a huge portion and start binging. So this popular dieting plan I'm recommending may work well for you. It's called intermittent fasting. Sounds foreign to me. It's an eating pattern between periods of fasting and eating. You're strictly forbidden from eating for a long stretch of time, and when you're allowed to, you can do it only for a short period. One plan for beginners is the 168 method. 168? Tell me more. You must fast for 16 hours continuously and only eat for the next 8 hours. If your last meal is at 8 p.m., it's only at midday you can eat your lunch followed by tea and dinner, all done before 8 p.m. After that, you start fasting again and follow the same cycle. While fasting, you can drink beverages but without sugar and milk. The best is just to drink water. That's marvellous. I don't have to force myself to eat only one meal. Next question. Can I eat anything I want? Oh no. Your meals should consist of more fruits, vegetables and proteins, but less carbohydrates. Follow this regime strictly. Intermittent fasting has been proven to reduce up to 8% of your body weight in 3 months. Studies have also shown that it improves blood sugar levels, decreases cholesterol and boosts longevity. Okay, thanks for the info, Ashok. That is the end of Dialogue 2. Now look at Dialogue 3. Dialogue 3. Listen to an interview between a reporter, Zarina, and Mr. Abdul, a spokesman from the meteorological station. As you listen, choose the correct answer for questions 29 and 30. You now have 15 seconds to look at the questions.
Now listen carefully and indicate your answers on the multiple choice answer sheet. Good morning, Mr. Abdul. People are interested in the weather forecast. Even housewives, businessmen and athletes plan their activities according to the forecast. Can you tell us more about your work which affects us globally? Good morning, Zarina. Yes, global weather forecast has gained much importance as the security and safety of the people are affected by weather. For example, a forecast of a thunderstorm. This is extremely important as emergency plans can be put in place quickly and properly. News can be aired beforehand to calm frightened people. Immediately, the countries concerned will prepare safe places to shelter the population. The army, police and firefighters will help move inhabitants and animals out of the danger zone. Yes, that's true. What about the economy of the countries that depend on the weather forecast? Weather forecast helps tremendously in this aspect. Ordinary people like you and me will bring an umbrella for shopping or cancel our trip to the beach when the forecast says rain. But for farmers, forecasts of weather can be obtained one week ahead. That means they can harvest crops like cotton or paddy when the sun is shining before bad weather destroys the crops. In this way, millions of dollars are saved. What about sports activities? Oh, definitely. Sports activities will be affected. Once poor weather is predicted, football and golf, for example, can be postponed. News can be given through the media. Players, officials and spectators are informed. This will prevent time and money wasted travelling to the venue. Even television crew will be happy not having to film in the rain as transmission may not be easy. This has been very informative indeed. Thank you, Mr. Abdul. Now you will listen to the recording again. Good morning, Mr. Abdul. People are interested in the weather forecast. Even housewives, businessmen and athletes plan their activities according to the forecast. Can you tell us more about your work which affects us globally? Good morning, Zarina. Yes, global weather forecast has gained much importance as the security and safety of the people are affected by weather. For example, a forecast of a thunderstorm. This is extremely important as emergency plans can be put in place quickly and properly. News can be aired beforehand to calm frightened people. Immediately, the countries concerned will prepare safe places to shelter the population. The army, police and firefighters will help move inhabitants and animals out of the danger zone. Yes, that's true. What about the economy of the countries that depend on the weather forecast? Weather forecast helps tremendously in this aspect. Ordinary people like you and me will bring an umbrella for shopping or cancel our trip to the beach when the forecast says rain. But for farmers, forecasts of weather can be obtained one week ahead. That means they can harvest crops like cotton or paddy when the sun is shining before bad weather destroys the crops. In this way, millions of dollars are saved. What about sports activities? Oh, definitely. Sports activities will be affected. Once poor weather is predicted, football and golf, for example, can be postponed. News can be given through the media. Players, officials and spectators are informed. This will prevent time and money wasted travelling to the venue. Even television crew will be happy not having to film in the rain as transmission may not be easy. This has been very informative indeed. Thank you, Mr. Abdul. That is the end of part 5. That is the end of the test. Please stop now. The invigilators will now collect your question papers and answer sheets.